so thank you all for having me over i i i came in with from a day of uh, discussing steel flyovers and diaries and corruption and so i'm a little i have to switch from that mode into talking about digital india but maybe there is some consistency in the in 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 talking about digital india and the, the role of uh, technology in governance so here's the thing i think uh, and most of you are you know uh, taught to look at things logically and case studies and so on uh, one of the things to understand is that um, and i'm a product of the early 90s i came back to india in the early 90s as a techie uh, and stumbled into entrepreneurship and then from there stumbled on to politics but one of the things that is quite clear to me and i have said this repeatedly is that from the time we liberalized and there is this date that we call liberalization the time when liberalization started which is 90 the early 90s the private sector has in in india transformed itself uh consumers and citizens have benefited tremendously from the expanded role of the private sector and the expanded role of private capital and so you have today airlines multiple airlines multiple uh, you know in almost every category that affects a consumer you have multiple choice all made possible by the uh, presence of private capital and expanded role for the private sector in india and to a large extent you can also look around you and say between the 19s and 2017 private sector in india itself has become much more competitive much more global is now uh, you know in in lot of cases competing with the best in class around the world but one of the things that remains almost the same if not i would argue on a on a on a uh, nominal basis uh, or on a, on a real basis declining is what i call governance government and the institutions of government so i have argued a lot uh, in parliament and outside during the entire 10 years that i have been in public life that while private sector in india entrepreneurship and the individual has transformed itself over the last two decades government as an institution or a collection of institutions have really declined and therefore there's this compelling argument for reforms in that space so to summarize in the early 90s you know you give the credit to narsimha rao you give the credit to manmohan singh or rajiv gandhi or whoever wants to take the credit there were there were reforms that reformed the private side of our economy and our nation but on the other hand the government side of our economy remains almost stagnant and flat this is my point of view i'm quite happy to have people dispute that but this then takes on a important it becomes very relevant because over the last decade decade and a half or even two decades the economy and the the quantum of assets and monies that the government and government institutions handle have now gone from a few billion to trillions of dollars now you just look at the dichotomy of this the private sector increasingly efficient increasingly global increasingly aspirational and aggressive and demanding and on the other side you have the government sector increasingly being given larger and larger quantum of assets and monies and to handle but in terms of reforms efficiency disclosure transparency responsiveness almost remaining flat stagnant or declining and so i have argued for a long time that reforms within the government and the political class will never happen because we just want it to happen there is an inherent status quo inherent inertia that keeps it that way and therefore technology is a important element of transforming government and the relationship between government and entrepreneur government and citizen now this speech this last part of the speech has been made by many people uh, over the last two decades about and i have has been used to justify investments in e governance and for many many years i don't know how many of you have engaged with government or dealt with government 
you would have seen governments around the country and governments in Delhi talk about X thousand crores or X hundred crores being spent on e-governance. Now, I, I've read a report recently that said that if you just look at state governments over the last decade, they have spent over 40, almost 40,000 crores in e-governance. And I don't see, I mean, I don't know if I'm uh, naturally pessimistic, but I don't see any state having transformed itself governance-wise after spending eight, ten billion dollars of, oh no, 40,000 is not eight, ten billion, it's more than that. Uh, that many billions of dollars of uh, public money. And the answer is very simple, that e-governance as has technology has long been about a solution looking for a problem rather than a problem being solved with a solution. So what we've had with this 40,000 crores of uh, e-governance spend in, by the states in one decade is that a lot of computers have been bought, a lot of word processing software has been bought, Microsoft has become rich, other companies that sell routers and uh, internet infrastructure has become rich, but the actual person to whom this was aimed at, which is the citizen or the entrepreneur or the business, has benefited very little. So which is why I, I look at Digital India, this new narrative of technology in government, I consider it a completely new way of looking at technology in government. So let me just say again, that technology being embedded in government is not a new idea. It has been around for a while. Technology benefiting and making government more, efficiency, more efficient also is not a new idea. It's been around a while. But the key has been that it has always been a technology solution constructed in a lab or in a computer company, then thrust on a government department as silos with no real uh, architecture or nothing binding it together. And where Digital India, this new narrative of what we've always known is necessary, is different, is that it looks at it as an architecture. It looks at it as a solution to a problem. And the problem being how to make government more efficient, how to make government more transparent, how to create a much more simpler in engagement model between government, government institutions, and the citizen that is seeking to engage with government. So, uh, so you, will, you would think I'm a bit of an over-the-top ambassador of Digital India, which I am, because of precisely the reason that I told you. I, I have met many technologists in India who spend a lot of time talking about technology, but don't talk to enough about the solution that it, they are trying to solve, or the problem that they're trying to solve. And I think the approach of this government, whether it is mygov.in, and what I hope will be the future mygov OS, is really about looking at government becoming more efficient, more network, more internetwork, and operating off of the same set of quant databases uh, across ministries and across institutions um, than just computerizing one department with three computers and a printer. But having said that, let's, let's step back a bit and say, what are the challenges? I mean, I think uh, it's very easy for me, especially when you're in Beng uh, Bengaluru and everybody understands technology quite a bit, to wax eloquently about the next great technology buzzword. I mean, I can give you a speech on that and you will all walk away reasonably impressed. But let's back off of that and look at what are the challenges to really making India digital? Uh, having just established the point that there needs to be an architectural approach, a solution to a problem approach, rather than just technology. The two fundamental issues that we are important for us, and I, I suspect as students and uh, people who are engaged in the subject of public policy, you should, un you should be aware of this. One is what we are seeing after demonetization which is the presence of internet. While we are one of the largest connected bases in the, in the world, we are also one of the largest unconnected nations in the world. We are about 800 million people unconnected to the internet. We are 250 to 300 million people, if you count all the smartphones as being internet uh, devices. So we are amongst the largest unconnected uh, internet nations in the world. So how do we roll out connectivity? 
because the core essence of digital india is to take government to the last man or woman take governance to the last man and woman make government accessible to not just bengaluru maleshwara rajaji nagar or hyderabad but to take it to the villages of jharkhand orissa north karnataka and make take disintermediate government and the agents from the relationship between citizen and government internet penetration in india is not is not a trivial thing because unlike cellular phones uh, which i as you know i was part of that whole roll out of that network which is a pure wireless network even the backbones were wireless with microwave initially internet by its very nature requires broadband pipes uh, if not to the home at least to the district and to the village and so the issue really is today the biggest challenge is how do we roll out uh, broadband for about one decade we struggled with this idea we as an I, i speak for all of us we as an we as a nation by giving this task to one government entity now while i believe there are uh, pockets of excellence within government isro department of atomic energy these are all excellent examples of uh, you know government doing well this is not particularly in area because of the organization it, it was residing in which is bsnl a terribly smart thing to do so we spent about 10 years 12 years of really wasting a lot of time spending a lot of money effectively getting nowhere so now the government is moving to a model where the proliferation of the broadband infrastructure that is required the pipes that are required to connect up the villages with the last mile being wireless or the last 10 miles being wireless would be an ecosystem of private and public investment so rather than depending only on public investment so that will accelerate the growth of our backbone and the growth of the access to the internet and that is a fundamentally important very vital uh, element of transforming and digitizing india having said that the other challenge in this area itself is and this is something that you uh, as public policy students would uh, be interested in studying is the performance of independent regulators telecom and technology in india not technology as in software but te- technology as in technology infrastructure is heavily impacted by the regulatory mindset or the regulatory uh, policy framework that the independent regulator from time to time lays out so there is a overall ecosystem policy ecosystem that the regulator lays out that must be incentivizing these investment and making them viable the regulator unfortunately in india despite being uh, almost now 20 years old the telecom regulator is an area that we have not built adequate capacity in so even for an issue like net neutrality i don't know how many of you have studied that subject i raised this issue in 2015 october first and one and a half years later we still struggle as a country to determine the policy framework of an important critical element like net neutrality and that in my mind is a reasonable sign even by our indian rate of progress reasonable signs of re- regulatory incapacity so while we know how to create proliferate infrastructure broadband infrastructure the piece the soft piece of of having a regulatory institutional framework that will encourage this and do so in a manner that is uh, confident building for the investors and gives them gives them adequate returns we still are fighting we are still struggling not fighting struggling to to develop and that goes to the heart of a lot of problems that we have in india which is when we have a problem we are quick to jump to a solution which is a technology solution let's say but we forget that in between the solution and the problem there is what we call the institutional space occupied by government or government institutions and that is not as trivial as it looks from bangalore for somebody who spends almost 200 days a year in delhi i can i can assure you that it can exhaust even the most enthusiastic energetic entrepreneur or enthusiastic energetic public servant 
so that is something that we have to we have to deal with at some point the the uh, and, and urgently the whole regulatory framework there is a third element of this issue of uh, uh, as we become more digital which are what which is what i call digital literacy there isn't enough debate amongst public policy makers or indeed the government or indeed normal citizen about elements of digital literacy. now i'll give you an example of aadhaar uh, the country in my opinion is divided into a pro aadhaar and an anti aadhaar uh camp and that is very tragic because aadhaar as a need is a real need the ability to identify indian citizens as indian citizens and being able to classify them in terms of socio economic category to be able to be eligible for public spending program is an absolutely important need but the lack of a debate and a discussion and scrutiny around the architecture of that project has caused it to effectively become what it is today it is a large database a monolithic huge database very vulnerable to cyber attacks very vague about issues like individual privacy and very unclear in law and legislation about liabilities arising out of data integrity breaches now what why i brought that example up is there is never enough of a debate in media or in public policy makers around these sophisticated transformational platforms that we are going to increasingly do more of to make sure that what we get is something that will work for us in the long term so that is what i call digital literacy or digital let's call it digital literacy for want of a better better phrase so regulatory capacity digital literacy and debate about what we want is these are two important areas that we have to address the other big major bucket is arise, arising out of digitization and as as we go and we will cross these hurdles that i told you about and soon in about let's say 4 to 5 years assume for a minute not assume it's a safe uh, sort of projection to make that from 250 million indians we will be at 800 million indians online we will be transacting business there will be the cash uh, quantum in our economy would have come down a lot of the transactional elements in our day to day lives will be completely digital there will be huge amounts of data about personal conduct personal behavior personal choice that will be in databases all around the country with private vendors government etc etc and suddenly you have this huge issue about privacy uh, what happens if i take your identity and i start misusing that identity theft what happens if i breach a database or the database holder leaks the database of your in important personal information who do you as an individual go to seek compensation and justice from and the bottom line is there is no legislative framework today that protects an individual consumer or gives him any magna carta of right as a digital indian you have in the constitution the freedom of expression you have all of those fundamental rights but as you become a digital indian and move on to online and your lives become online there is a need for evolving legislative framework that guarantees you rights as a consumer or as a citizen online and that is an important issue and as you can see now it's increasingly becoming an issue i raised this issue some some years ago 3 4 5 years ago and i was laughed at and i was told uh, this is a very elitist issue and you know it is only people who you know some people want it why is there and i even told by somebody what is there for people to hide that they are worried about that they will lose online so you know things like that there is a reasonably uh, silly argument and went on for 4 years i went to the supreme court i filed a petition there in the supreme court uh, linking aadhar and many other issues and said constitutional right is it is is right to privacy a constitutional right or not this government through the attorney general went to court and said it is not that means privacy is not a right that an individual can enjoy 
Now that matter is still in the Supreme Court. I strongly believe privacy is a very fundamental right. The most encouraging thing that came out is after demonetization, when I raised this issue in a consultative committee meeting uh, with the finance minister saying, what would happen if, let's say, Paytm took my uh, data and gave it to somebody? Who am I to sue? What, what is my protection under law? The IT Act doesn't protect me at all because IT Act, I don't know if you've read the IT Act. The IT Act, if your information is misused, uh, given away by, a, let's say, Amazon or Flipkart, you can only sue Flipkart and Amazon provided you can prove that Amazon and Flipkart misuse that information. So the onus is completely on you to prove the crime or prove the, uh, it's not on the corporate. So these things, uh, like the IT Act, for example, was developed in 2008, was passed in Parliament when uh, the infamous Raja, A. Raja was the Telecom Minister. Um, and he, obviously this was not high on his priority, some other things were high on his priority. And this was passed in two minutes flat in Parliament. It, there was no debate, there was no nothing, as, and you, as you know, as a consequence of that lack of debate, the bill then went was challenged on Section 66A. A lot of people went to jail uh, on freedom of expression issues and Section 66A. Then I went to Supreme Court and challenged it and the Supreme Court struck that down. So, uh, so long story short, there is a huge issue that is uh, looming in, in, in front of us before a Digital India can be a real success, which is the issue of uh, individual rights in an online world, individual uh, protection in an online world. Let me just quickly end by saying, and then there are issues like data encryption, and I won't, I won't, I mean, actually on Digital India I can speak for a couple of days, if you let me, but I won't uh, take that much time. There are many challenges, for example, we don't have a national policy on encryption. We are still very, very, uh, as a nation, that whole area of encryption, we are very, very behind the US, Israel, and other countries. So that's an area which becomes almost like a bread and butter as uh, the nation becomes online and more and more of our commerce comes online. But I'll end by saying this, that if the, 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 uh, the stated architecture of a digital India is implemented and technology is embedded into government and governance in large doses to solve the problem, and the problem that we will solve is the problem of transparent, transparency in governance and easier engagement between government and citizen, then Digital India will be a resounding success. And that will be the catalyst for the governance reforms that this country so, so desperately needs. If we have Digital India, we will not have things like the steel flyover, we will not have things like A Raja, we will not have things like all of those things that make us you know, ashamed of our government sometimes. Uh, I am personally very proud to be an MP. I believe serving in parliament is a privilege and an honor. And so it, it is, like most of you, painful sometimes to see that the government and governance gets defined by the aberrations or the, the, the general, uh, general uh, uh, shattering of the confidence be uh, between government and the citizens it's supposed to serve. But Digital India is the way to go for us to catalyze government and governance reforms. Of that I have no doubt. I'm a big believer in that. And the more there are people in the public policy space that actively and uh, in, uh, get engaged in the subject, have views on the subject, research it, the better the debate will be and the better the future of Digital India. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Jai Hind.